Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's episode is titled, How Roman Law Became the Foundation of the Criminal Justice System. And we're joined by lead scholar Sarah E. Bond from the University of Iowa. Today is April the 13th, 2021. I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us tonight. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the National Humanities Center. Feels like we've been doing this for quite a while. We have. We began the webinar series back in early September, and since then, on a weekly, sometimes uh, twice a week, I've welcomed you on behalf of our staff, Libby and Mike, and our grad students, Hannah and Carly and Josh. Um, it's a little hard to believe that the uh, semester is winding down, the academic calendar is beginning to flip, particularly in such a a weird and disrupted uh, world as we're living in right now. And I, I know and I sense that all of you are, um, are grappling with and, uh, and succeeding in a, a really different kind of teaching environment than you've ever had before in your life. Uh, for that reason, I always like to thank uh, some of you individually for joining us. Please do know that uh, we, we welcome and are uh, fully appreciate all of you being with us. But in particular tonight, I noticed that Catherine's with us from Long Beach. It's, it's nice to have someone from Long Beach with us. Uh, Napoleon's also from the Los Angeles area. SJ is uh, representing the Research Triangle High School, which is located just around the corner from the National Humanities Center. Paul's joining us from Dallas tonight. Aaron is all the way over at the American School in Vietnam. And hey, Frederick, I really do appreciate you being here. Uh, I just earlier today loaded an article that you published. Uh, er uh, Frederick is at uh, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg. And uh, we're really pleased to be able to offer some of your work as uh, resources for tonight's uh, session. The National Humanities Center is also uh, nearing the end of its academic calendar. Um, we have just recently announced and will be welcoming our 44th annual fellowship class of scholars next September. We're hopeful, as I'm sure all of you are, that that will be, if not back into a normal place, certainly in a more stable and more predictable place. Uh, one thing that I do know that uh, all of our scholars really keep into consideration, though, is the ways that their scholarship can be accessed by and be important to the world at large. Uh, that's classrooms, certainly, as many of you are representing, but it's also the communities they live in. It's the, uh, it's the, the, the citizenry that they represent. They're constantly trying to find ways that what they do can speak to how we better understand ourselves. And I think tonight's session will, uh, in my mind, be a really good illustration of how, you know, how sometimes younger kids struggle with that sense of long ago and far away, but being able to draw those very direct threads between something that may have happened several thousand years ago with the world we live in right now is very important. Whether you teach this particular content in your curriculum or if it's just something that you can, uh, you can add to your own professional uh, conversation. I do want to encourage you to continue to use the Humanities and Class Digital Library. You'll be able to find there um, all the resources associated with tonight's session. That does include and will include the recordings of tonight's session. Uh, our, uh, Carly, our grad student intern, uh, edits those uh, each week and adds not only the full recording, but also uh, sections it and edits it by topic. So you can use 10 and 12 minute sections, perhaps in a formative assessment, perhaps uh, with uh, something that you do in your class or some kind of flipped digital classroom. Uh, all of these are generally posted within three or four days. Uh, we, we do take a little bit of time to process, but I would encourage you to join the webinar series and then go to the specific page associated with tonight's webinar to find those materials. You'll also find in the library materials from uh, over 80 other humanities organizations, and that does include quite a few organizations that have resources, both scholarly and instructional, that are relevant to tonight's topic. Uh, hard to believe, but we only have five sessions left after tonight. Uh, I do encourage you to go back to our registration page and sign up for any that you might find interesting. Uh, you know, when you first review this, the, the full schedule of 40 some semi uh, seminars, you might not really want to commit to something that's uh, six or eight months in, in advance. But now that we're coming to the conclusion of the spring semester, I invite you to go back and take a look, sign up if you're interested. Please do share it with your colleagues and your faculty. We would love to have them join us as well. And as you know, each of these webinars does earn you five professional development credit hours. These are recognized by just about every state in the country and Los Angeles Unified Public uh, School District. So uh, please do take some time to sign up. If, like Lilith, you're realizing that the webinars are slowly coming to an end, at least for this year, you might also consider one of our online courses. These courses actually earn you 35 hours of credit 
for about the same amount of work five weeks in a row. So our next slate, of course, is opens um, in May, and we would love to have you register and consider joining us for one of those uh, fascinating topics. I want to thank, as I always do, the Teacher Advisory Council for their contributions this year, uh, particularly in this disrupted pandemic year. Um, it's really been important for us to, uh, to hear from them, to learn from them, to have their contributions shape the work that we do. We would also love for many of you, all of you, to consider applying for next year's cohort. Uh, we are currently accepting applications. You can find it on our website, and we'll be making final decisions sometime in mid-May or so. I think the application um, process closes on May the 3rd. So if you attend a lot of webinars, if you like the work we do, and you'd like to work a little bit more closely with us, including a visit to the National Humanities Center next fall, then I would encourage you to uh, put together your application packet. So tonight's webinar uh, is an audio and PowerPoint only webinar, but your participation is very, very important. So please do use the audience chat box to uh, share thoughts, to uh, chatter at each other, to share some links if you like, but use the Ask Professor Bond tab to submit more formal questions as the moderator, I'll review those and cue them and bring them to uh, Professor Bond's attention when the time seems right. Um, if for some reason, you know, your, your Wi-Fi gets disrupted or you can't quite hear the audio the way you had hoped, please do make sure that you check the audio button that's just underneath Professor Bond's photograph. And then if it still just is not working well, uh, you can either refresh your screen or you can log out and come back in. It will not disrupt your, your uh, documentation of attendance. So again, tonight's session is titled How Roman Law Became the Foundation of the Criminal Justice System. I'm joined by Sarah E. Bond, Professor of History at the University of Iowa. I'm also very pleased tonight to welcome uh, Maureen Lamb, who is joining us from uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. Maureen is a classics, a Latin teacher in Connecticut, and she's going to be our TA. Um, just between you and I, Sarah, uh, Maureen's been waiting for this particular session for nearly eight months since we announced it, so I'm really glad that, uh, that she could join us. Um, so having said all that, um, I'm very pleased to welcome Sarah Bond to uh, tonight's seminar. Hey, Sarah, can you hear me out there in, in Iowa? I can. Thank you so much for okay. welcoming me. Um, I wanted to say a special thank you to you and to Maureen and to Libby and to everybody at the National Humanities Center. I I'm just so flattered to, to be here with you guys to talk about this subject, which I, I teach an entire course on uh, that's split between the University of Iowa uh, College of Law and the regular arts and sciences here at the university. Fantastic. Um, before we begin, Professor, I, I wonder if um, I wonder if I could ask you just to sort of frame tonight to address one particular angle for what you'll be sharing, I think, and the good work that you do. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, educators and folks in the room, um, you know, uh, folks who really take this seriously, they think about it a lot, but they don't necessarily teach ancient history or world history or Latin or the classics. Can you, uh, can you explain, can you talk to us just a little bit at the onset about why all of our curriculum, regardless of what we teach in a way, is impacted by the work of classicists, that in some ways it, it sort of runs through everything that we think about. Sure, I, I think that classics is a, a very important subject to study, not because I believe in a narrative of Western exceptionalism, which has been traditionally the way that classicists have defended how and why we exist. I think something that is important is simply to have a depth of understanding about where many of the institutions, whether they be good or bad, uh, come from. And within the world that we live in in the U.S., many of those institutions, whether they be um, the prison system or whether they be uh, Roman law or even classical architecture that we're going to talk about has been heavily influenced by the classical world. And so uh, I don't want to, to ever make an argument that what I'm going to talk about today um, is the best law code or the best justice system. Um, I, I think it's just simply important to understand the roots and the reception of Roman Roman law and the fact that the founding fathers uh, in particular were very important mediators that brought in a lot of classical 
legislation, um, art, and thinking into the world that we live in today. And so even if you aren't a classicist, I think it's important to understand that visually, um, but also in terms of the world we live in today, um, it is heavily influenced by especially the, the Roman world and to, to an extent the Greek world as well. Fantastic. I appreciate you uh, setting that stage. We're really anxious to hear how you uh, illustrate these, how you provide this this uh, this, this connection for us. Um, again, as the moderator, I'll be bringing questions to you uh, periodically, uh, but I'll turn the slide now over to you, and, and we're anxious to hear what you can share. Sure, and feel free to interrupt me as we go along. My students know that um, raising your hand or just asking a question, I'm happy to go off on tangents and to explain things that, that may be unclear. Um, as I said before, this is a semester-long class that I teach uh, on Roman law, and so oftentimes I will have JD I will have JD candidates in my class as well as undergraduates, and so I want this to be as accessible as possible to all people, and that's why all of the Latin is translated and is not necessary, um, I hope, to, to understand and to really connect with what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and before we can actually talk about Roman law, I want to talk about the visual setting of classics um, and the connection between legitimacy and the classical world that we have to unpack and really address before we can move forward to understanding how Roman law uh, got very wrapped up into our current justice system. Um, I think about aesthetics and I think about classical art a fair amount because I'm also a contributor to an arts journal called Hyperallergic. But Perhaps the most uh, disturbing thing connected to neoclassicism was in February, we were told that there was going to be an executive order that eventually was released in December um, that was going to stipulate via um, President Trump's executive order that all architecture was going to need to essentially be classical um, in order to provide a visual testimony to the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American government. Um, and I think we can probably all list 10 or 20 neoclassical structures within D.C. and many other places within the United States. Um, but I think this also very much sums up what a lot of people think about the Roman and the Greek world, is that it provides legitimacy, justification, and also dignity um, to many of the actions and ideas that we may have. Um, and you can see just one example of this with Abraham Lincoln, who is sitting in a throne that is very much modeled after uh, after a Greek temple, and he has fasces, that is to say bundles of sticks that were used by Roman lictors on either side of the throne he is sitting on. Now, he is, has fasces on either side um, that were carried by uh, the lictors that followed Roman magistrates with bundles of sticks in order to enforce the law. Um, so we're here seeing a visualization of the president or the executive being uh, someone who has the ability to enforce things either through the courts or through actual physical harm, which is what lictors were able to do with those sticks that we call fasces and which eventually would give us the word fascism. Um, so I, I wanna kind of look at why it is important to understand both the good and the bad of Roman influences through the lens of law. A lot of people don't take uh, a direct look at the iconography that is actually on many of the neoclassical monuments we have in DC. But for me, probably the most potent example of the influence and genealogy of Roman law, at least uh, in the conceptualization of the 18th, 19th, and then early 20th century, is on the very doors of the Supreme Court. And you can see uh, here that I have excerpted from supremecourt.gov 
gov, which is the official website of the Supreme Court, um, that these doors were not installed until 1935, but they were commissioned in order to show significant events in the evolution of uh, justice in the Western world. It starts off with, uh, you know, as we always do in the ancient world, with Homer um, and the shield of Achilles showing the Greek heroes that are engaged in a legal dispute. But then we move into a formation of Roman law that would really inform a lot of the thinking uh, of the, the later founding fathers. We have something that we're going to talk about in just a little bit called the Praetor's Edict. We have a visualization of Julian, who was a jurist during the second century CE and a very early legal teacher within the high Roman Empire. Um, up at top to the left, you have Justinian and his corpus Juris Civilis, that is the codification of civil law. We have then a, uh, if we go back down to the bottom, is really when we have the chronology picking up in 1215 with King John and the Magna Carta. Then moving into a uh, more early modern and modernity by going to the chancellor and the first statute of Westminster, uh, Lord Coke uh, talking to King James and keeping him from sitting as judge, and then finally finishing with Chief Justice Marshall and the legal scholar Joseph Story. So we have here a, a, a visualization that kind of creates a, a comic, a, a way of understanding how justice came about that connects America back to Greco-Roman antiquity. And I want to uh, complicate that a little bit more by saying that this was not a direct line from Roman law um, into the current American justice system, um, that in actuality we have the American justice system being a system that is predicated on something that we call common law. Um, and for those of you who have studied law before, you know that there are two major types of law, not the only types, but the two major types within the world. And there is a, a map here that you can see where it is geolocated, but we have common law, which is predominantly within the area of Britain. Um, and then we have uh, we have civil law, which predominated in the area of the continents. And I'll go over what that means in just a little bit, but it's just important to know that the reason that America is actually predicated on common law is because of the influence from Britain, uh, because of the founding of the 13 original colonies. And so we have much of our legal codices and understanding of law as inherited actually from Britain. However, uh, that does not mean that the founding fathers were not cognizant of or uh, able to really bring in and, and uh, take parts of the Roman civil law that had predominated within the continent. As many of you will already know, many of the founding fathers were themselves Francophiles, um, and the French were uh, actually following a civil code. If we even just look at the libraries of the founding fathers in order to expound on, on what might have been important to them in order to, to see the books that they were reading and really connecting with, we see that uh, Thomas Jefferson actually had a number of translations of Justinian's Institutes. Um, and it became extremely popular within the United States because the first English translation of the Institutes came out in the year 1812. And I believe we still have a letter that may be still at the Library of Congress, or perhaps Monticello has it, um, which is writing to the translator and congratulating him on, on this amazing achievement. Uh, the translation of Greek into Latin and oftentimes then Latin into English would allow for the growth and reception of many of these legal codices. Uh, but in addition to that, we should always understand that the founding fathers has themselves been trained in reading Latin and oftentimes Greek um, and were oftentimes able to, to read classical texts uh, by just simply picking them up. 
Alexander Hamilton went to King's College, which is now Columbia in 1773, um, and passed with flying colors his entrance exams reading the Aeneid and Cicero. We also have Thomas Jefferson, who of course went on to uh, have studies at the College of William and Mary, um, and had a number of Scottish professors that would speak to him about the law. And this is important because if you look back at that map here um, in the slide earlier, you will see that Scotland um, actually earlier on during the course of the 18th century is a mix of civil and also common law. And so oftentimes when uh, Scottish law professors or Scottish classicists would come and teach within various universities in the US, they would communicate a mixture of both common law and civil law. Um, that is to say, one that is based in a Roman tradition and one that is more based um, on the common law formulated within England. But Jefferson wasn't the only one. James Madison went to Princeton and fluently read Greek. John Adams and John Hancock both went to Harvard. And they had a, a lot of contact not only with classical authors like Cicero and Virgil, but oftentimes were asked to read juristic opinions, um, such as those from very famous Roman jurists who would oftentimes write about Roman law, like the jurist Gaius and also the jurist Julian, who was pictured in the doors of the Supreme Court. And so we have a common law system within the United States, but it is not what we might call pure in any way. If we scratch underneath the surface of our American common law, we will see that within individual states' rights and, and state codes, that there is a very heavy influence of civil law that is grounded in earlier Roman law. And that is because America did not come together as a monolithic nation overnight. And it wasn't just the 13 original colonies. So if, for instance, we look at the laws of Louisiana, which originally was a uh, French territory until Thomas Jefferson made the Louisiana Purchase, we will see that there is a heavy influence at the state level of civil law. And what are the differences even between these two systems? I've tried to only briefly lay them out here for you so that you can see, but common law is generally uncodified, although uh, we have an attempt within English common law to, to codify it in the mid 18th century. Um, common law also has a lot of legislative decisions that are based predominantly on precedent. Um, we have a lot of judicial decisions and thus there is a lot of influence and weight, a lot of gravitas that are given to judges who have a huge impact on the overall system. And in the 16th century, there was a movement to bring more Roman law into the common law that had been established within England during the 12th century, uh, when it actually had been instituted by Henry II of England. Um, so we have common law not completely mutually exclusive from Roman law, um, but the reforms and legal teaching in the 18th and 19th century bring Roman law in vogue in England, particularly within the law schools themselves. Now, in terms of civil law, uh, we have usually a codification, and we are going to talk about a number of attempts to codify Roman civil law codes, and I already mentioned one of them under the Emperor Justinian, which was pictured in the doors of the Supreme Court. But civil law also has a, a lot of substantive law that establishes which acts are subject to criminal or civil prosecution. And we will uh, break those up and look at what Romans think of as a criminal act versus what we think of as a criminal act today. It also stipulates procedural law and establishes how to determine whether a particular action constitutes a criminal act. Um, now, 
a lot of this influence is not received directly from people like Cicero and Cato, but actually filtered through a lot of early modern philosophers living in France that were very popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. People like Montesquieu and earlier Voltaire, we have people reading their thoughts, but they themselves have been heavily influenced by the, the civil law that was established within Rome earlier on. Now, when we study Roman law, we actually have three different time periods that we break it up into. And these are all eras that, that are um, made up by historians today, but it helps us to understand the formulation of Roman law over such a long period of time, because Rome is founded in the year 753 BCE. Um, and uh, by all accounts, for me, Rome doesn't fall until the sacking of Constantinople in 1453. Other people will tell you that it ends with Justinian in 565 or the sack of Rome in 410. But whatever the case, Rome has a very long existence and we cannot speak about Roman law as if it existed as one static monolith for the entirety of its existence. We have to allow it an evolution as an organism in the same way that we study American law and its changes from the earlier republic uh, into the period that we are living in now. And the first period we have in Roman law is called pre-scientific. And this is a lot of custom and a focus on orality, as we will see, that there are written fragments of law and there are attempts to write law down. But this is a, a much more reflective stage of Roman law coming together and being orally based in terms of how trials actually come to be, but also how you accuse people. Um, now, between 150 BCE, which is getting towards the later Republic, into the, the period of the five good emperors, and let's just say mm, the end of the movie Gladiator, um, is the mature period of Juris and the creation of legal science. And we'll talk much more about that in just a minute, but this is the, the period that we have uh, very influenced by Cicero, but also particularly by Juris who are not jurists in the way that we talk about them that sit on a jury, but rather people who study Roman law and then give out legal opinions, particularly to politicians and magistrates and uh, oftentimes to the emperors themselves. And after this period of maturity, we have the age of authority. This is really when we see emperors themselves attempting to create extremely authoritative law um, and then working to project that legitimacy and authority through the codification of law. And so one thing that it's important to, to think about is that the power not only to make law, but to codify law projects an image to humanity and to your populace that you have control, that you have the ability to control power over large groups of people. Um, it's very performative, even if it is also very utilitarian. I think. Uh, Professor, if I could interrupt you just briefly, um, I, this feels like the right time to bring Jeremiah's question to you. Jeremiah is joining us from Colorado tonight, um, and he's wondering if you can speak uh, speak to this notion that that praetors, that, that the edicts also establish precedent in court proceedings. Is, is this common law? Uh, I will... Because I want to answer this directly, I'm going to go to my Praetor's Edict slide sure. and bring it up here. The Praetor's Edict is incredibly important to, to address because let me just say that the Praetor is a yearly magistracy uh, within the city of Rome, and the Praetor sets an edict out. Um, at the beginning of the year that sets the rules for appearing in front of any court, um, particularly the Praetor's Court, but a number of other um, uh, individual Praetors in various other cities often imitate this, this edict on a yearly basis. Um, and it says who can come before the Praetor and actually ask for an action to be brought against another person. Um, it excluded those under 17 and the death, for instance. 
Um, and we have uh, the assigning of an advocate um, if, uh, if they did not have one. Now, there were certain groups of people that could not come before it, but as um, our speaker has already hinted at, um, we have a codification of the Preter's Edict, which was subject to little bits of change on a yearly basis under the Juris Salvius Julianus. So we have the uh, Julian, people just call him Julian instead of Salvius Julianus, but he's the one that actually crystallizes and puts the Preter's Edict into stone. Um, and the Preter's Edict is a document of civil law. It's saying who can come uh, before the judges. And it was imitated by Preters all over the Roman Empire. So you're exactly right. This has a huge impact. And it also has a huge influence in the United States because it dictates what shamefulness really is. Because those with infamia, that is to say those with infamy, like prostitutes, actresses, um, those individuals who have been accused of be doing shameful things, gladiators, they cannot come before the Preter's Court because they are undignified. Um, and so even if we don't use the Preter's Edict um, in totem uh, within the, the current legal system in the United States, it transfers a sense of who is reputable and who is disreputable into American discourse. And I think that is very important to understand. Why are actresses seen as infamous? Why are prostitutes, which are legal, by the way, in Roman law, so it's a little bit different, but why are prostitutes not able to, to come before the praetor? Um, I, I think that, that a huge impact of Roman law is the fact that it is very status-based. And so even if Americans say, oh, we're all equal before the law, I want to say that that's probably bullshit. So. Yeah. I don't Thank think you. that um, that's possibly true. <laughs> yeah. And An Angela is asking for a little bit of a clarification. Could you repeat, please, who fell into that category of uh, of of infamy? Sure. Um, so <laughs> this is funny. I, I have never gotten the chance to say this, so I'll just say it. Um, I actually wrote a book on this, um, and it is on infamous tradesmen, but also inclusive of, of people who have the, it is a Roman legal stigma called infamia, where we get the modern word infamy today. Um, and, uh, and it is a stigma that is put upon prostitutes, gladiators, um, actors, actresses, some musicians, um, and, and other people that are connected to the entertainment industry, as well as criers who are called prikones. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a very large legal stigma, and it means they didn't have legal redress. So if you had infamia, you did not have the power to bring an action, that is to say, to bring a case against somebody. You cannot act as a prosecutor against somebody else, and thus you open yourself up to violence, to rape, to many other assaults, because those people know that you can't bring them to court in order to prosecute them. Um, it's it's very it's pretty abhorrent. Um, so I think it is important to to point out that infamia excludes large numbers of people from being able to have legal rights in a way that is different than American culture. Great, thank you for taking that slight detour, and I appreciate you moving forward in your slides. But that seemed like a nice place to insert that. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And I, I want to take us into a, a closer microcosm of what we are talking about here, because even though Roman law spanned the entirety of the Roman Mediterranean, and this is uh, a little bit larger than the confines of, of the Roman Empire, which reached its height under the Emperor Trajan in 117 CE, but we're talking about over uh, a million square miles within the Roman Empire. And so um, thinking about how a lot of this legislation and the early system of Roman law came about, we really do have to focus in microcosmically um, on the city of Rome itself, which is founded at least mythically by Romulus in 753 BC, shortly after killing his twin brother Remus. And as a twin, I find this very offensive, um, but also Romulus is seen as the first king of Rome in what we call the monarchial period. 
The monarchs are the seven kings of Rome. If you're seeing a theme in the seven hills of Rome as well, then, then yes, that's very true. Um, and the seven kings of Rome are the ones that establish law first. But we really see it um, developing into the period that we call the Republic. And that's when we see uh, many more spaces for justice, the architecture of uh, Roman law really coming into being. So I took these pictures, or I took the picture on the left a number of years ago when I was writing an article on the history of the Roman Senate House. Uh, the Roman Senate House is still within the Roman Forum, even though it's been completely revamped and was bought by Mussolini in the 1920s as kind of a monument to fascism and his remaking of the city of Rome. Um, but this is probably the same Senate House that stood under the reign of Diocletian in the third century. And you can see a digital recreation of the Roman Senate House inside of it. But before we even get to the Roman Senate, we have to understand the philosophy of law that was embedded in many of the psyches of Romans that were living within the city. Um, Romans believed that there was a human law um, and that we had law and we also had an idea of injuria, which is to say injury, and it will be defined more um, in, in just a second. So we have human law that applies to wrongs that are done against another human. But we also have divine law that governs the relationship between the gods and man. And this is something that is then in a binary called fos versus nephos. Fos means all good. This is something that, that is in line with piety and with the Roman religio, that is to say Roman religion. If something is nephos, it is not divinely ordained and it's unlucky. So if we go back to that first slide that we looked at all the way back at the beginning, uh, which is actually a Roman calendar, see here, this is a Roman calendar. We have N's and F's that are on the, the left of each of uh, the days that tell us this is a day that is lucky and this is a day that is unlucky. So even the calendars of Rome are telling people what is uh, the law, but also what is, is divinely set by the gods. Um, one thing to, to understand is that legislation was presented to the public in the form of bronze tablets. This is a recreation of the laws that, that are probably most famous that are called the laws of the 12 tables. Um, and they were publicly presented on bronze, which is tended to be what was uh, how Roman legislation was early on published was within bronze inscriptions. Um, and that's meant that the that Romans could read it, but we also should keep in mind that Romans only have about a 10%, possibly up to 15% um, in terms of those who were actually able to read. The literacy rate is very low. So oftentimes you would have other people read things for you or you would recite them out. We are told, for instance, by Cicero, that small children, like the Pledge of Allegiance, were, were able to recite the laws of the 12 tables from memory. So we have civil law that is presented publicly, the use civilly, but we also have the use of unpaid, at this point, patrons and advocates. These are patroni, which come from, which is where we get the word patron from, who would help out their clients um, in order to uh, bring about legal trials um, or, or cases against other people. But then we also have people that act as what we might call lawyers who were called advocates. So Cicero was, for instance, an advocate um, for many groups of people, whether that was a whole province as in uh, the prosecution of the governor varies, or for just individual men that, that he came to their defense. But at this time, it was considered gauche and, and uh, you were not supposed to pay your lawyers, that, that money was not supposed to exchange hands. Um, okay, moving on to the laws of the 12 tables. I know that many of you read about it in, in the reading that, that I uh, sent out um, rather belatedly the other night. Um, but it's important to see that Romans believe in status 
and that status should dictate the treatment by law. And this is different, at least ideally, from Roman law, even though I think in the social realm that we live in, people are treated um, by their status in society, unfortunately. Um, as we are going to see, oftentimes the courts act as a uh, larger framework for what the family unit is ideally seen as within Roman law. Okay, I'm not going to go through uh, all of my love of flowcharts. You guys can certainly um, look at them in the future, but I did want to mention that a lot of the legislation within the Roman Republic is not passed by the Senate, which predominantly is a funding institution, um, even though they are allowed to pass things called Senatus Consulta that are, um, uh, these are great laws from the Senate um, in extreme measures. Most of the legislation from the Roman Republic is formed in a comitia, and this is going to have a huge impact on the uh, founding fathers' understanding of the role of assemblies and the role of popular groups in order to influence the creation of legislation. So we have uh, the, the four major committee that we have within the Roman Republic visualized here. Um, but remember, early on in the Roman Republic, uh, we have a separation between two classes of people. We have the patricians, who are part of the original families of the founding of Rome. And then we have the plebeians, which are everybody else. So we have people who are connected to the original families that have founded the city of Rome. And then the plebeians, which simply aren't patricians. A lot of people like to say plebeians are the poor people, because that's how we use it in parlance today, that plebs are just poor people. But in actuality, they're just like, you know, the patricians are like the daughters of the American Revolution. They're just people who can trace their lineage back to the, the early days of Rome um, and thus have status as a result of it. But as we'll see in something called the struggle of the orders that happens uh, over the course of a couple hundred years after the founding of the Republic in 509 BCE by Brutus, we have the founding of this republic, which eventually will have a struggle between patricians and plebeians, and then have a law code that will be applied to all. That eventually plebiscites that had only been applied against plebeians will eventually be applied through something called the Lex Hortensia, the Hortensian Law, to all people within the city of Rome. And this is a huge moment in Roman law because it means that it does not just dictate the plebeians' lifestyle and what they are held accountable for, but also holds the patricians accountable for the same things. Now, I know that a lot of people can get very confused about the different terminologies within Roman law and what exactly we are talking about when we say the word delict or delictum in Latin. Uh, a delict within Roman law is a private wrong. Um, and this is very important within Roman law to understand what is considered to be a private wrong, that is to say, um, a civil wrong against another individual, as opposed to something that is going to be damaging on a public level, which is when it gets classified as a wrong, uh, as a crime. Now, Roman law is, I haven't put out the exact percentage here, but I would say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 90% civil law and delicts versus a very small number of criminal legislation um, and actual criminal laws. And that's because Romans uh, are, are very hard pressed ever to um, really classify anything as a crime. They would prefer things to be civil in terms of a wrong and to be able to be paid off by money. <laughs> they would prefer not to um, have to do major amounts of um, oversight over top of other people. But in terms of a delict, which is one of these major private wrongs, um, Romans determine whether something is with malice, that is to say with dolus, or it is done with negligence, um, that is to say with culpa. 
And within the area of the licks in particular, we have various different types within this civil law that is bodily injury. We have injuria, which might be against somebody's reputation, for instance. We have the theft of property, which includes, by the way, enslaved individuals, because as we'll talk about in a moment, Romans live within a slave system that they believe in chattel slavery, um, and also includes uh, theft committed by means of violence, which is called rapina, where we will eventually get the word rape from. Okay, uh, I know that this can get complex, but Roman civil procedure um, is, is very much uh, something that changes from the earlier Republic in 509 BCE to the end of the Republic. Um, legis actiones is the Latin word that we use for Roman lawsuits. These are actions that are being brought against various people. And before a lawsuit can even be brought, the first phase we have is that these wrongs, uh, whatever the delict is that you would like to bring against them, is brought uh, before first a pontiff um, in the earlier republic and then later before the praetor and orally pled. So just like we saw with the laws of the Twelve Tables, Earlier Roman law is very orally based and very focused on uh, bringing things before the praetor in order to say whether a action can even come into being. Before a lawsuit can even move forward, there has to be a eudex or a praetor that says that, that it can happen. Um, now, at this time, both parties had to be present and there was no appeal to a higher court. But this is going to change under the reign of the first emperor of Rome named Augustus. And it is going to be replaced by a system that is much more written down and much more able to include and address non-citizens as well as citizens. And this is something called the formulary system. The formulary system, um, I always tell my students that it's a lot like LegalZoom.com, if you've ever used it, that they have templates for various delicts and for various types of actions. So if the person two years ago had a cow stolen, you can use the, the formula that they used previously in order to um, bring somebody into court and drag them in there because your cow was stolen. Um, and so the formulary procedure means that there is much more formulation behind many of the lawsuits and thus there is much more uh, of a template that is being uh, replicated over time. And in differentiation from the civil law, because penal law is, is really much more exciting to people than learning about property codes, which I talk about for weeks at a time, um, penal law is something that really develops much more during the first century BCE, that is to say the late Roman Republic. Um, early criminal law had been seen as injurious um, to the health of the race publica, that is to say the republic, and the, so there wasn't a lot of focus on criminal law except for in major, major crimes such as treason, which is called maiesta, forgery, electoral malpractice, or the abuse of office. And we have to go back here and then really think about the fact that Romans see a crime as something that happens against the public order or against the state, whereas a civil delict is something against a private individual that is going to, to inflict harm on a private person. So this discrepancy between private versus public is very different um, than our criminal law codes uh, today. Um, before I get to really the, the heart of, of what I want to, to discuss tonight, um, and that is the Roman family, I want to just briefly talk about Roman criminal law because I do think it's, it's important to, to see that there are many similarities with our own justice system, but also many differences. One thing that, that I would stress about uh, the influence of Roman law is that it is incredibly paternal and focused on somebody that we call the pater familias. And I know every time I say that, I think about George Clooney saying it in O Brother, Where Art Thou? He's like, I'm a goddamn pater familias. 
Um, and yes, that that is the the actual term for the actual term for the head of family uh, within within Rome. And so what you have to you can't see what I'm doing right now, but I, I I'm making like a, a circle with my hands that you have the familia as a microcosm of the Roman state. Then you have Roma or Romanitas or the race publica, that is to say the Republic, which is a larger model of the familia. And then once we get to the Roman emperor himself, he casts himself, the emperor Augustus, as the patria potestas, that is to say the person, uh, the pater that is overseeing all of his family. So. The patriarchy and, and the pater familias is a very important person that doles out justice first. The first space of justice is within the Roman domicile, and that's why I have here in Roman criminal law that the pater familias could punish you by using his patria potestas. And that means that he even had the power of life and death, particularly over um, those people that are his wards rather than uh, necessarily his wife, but also because chattel slaves are considered to be property. Um, this is very much something that would influence the allowance of chattel slavery within the United States, is that chattel means that they are treated as though they are property and thus you can dispose of and punish your property in the way that you see fit. Um, so we have instances of Cato beating his slaves, um, and we have instances of Thomas Jefferson doing it as well. Um, I worked at Monticello. I excavated um, slave houses that, that are outside of Monticello proper. Um, I worked at Sally Hemings' mother's um, house um, in order to excavate what the Monticello group, and I can just tell you that, that the laws surrounding slavery had a huge influence on the, the founding fathers. Um, but I will go uh, much more, more into that in just a minute. I just wanted to go over some of Professor? the punishments. Uh-huh, yes, uh, happy Professor, to be here. I've got a, it's a quick question, and frankly, I don't think there's any good place to insert this other than just to sure. sort of eddy out for a moment and ask you a question that Angela from Delaware is bringing us. She frames it as being silly. I don't think so at all. These are the kinds of clarifying things you need to know when you work with younger kids. Angela is wondering, in the 12 tables, there's often references to, uh, to in reparations and fines to be paid in asses. Is that mm -hmm. dollars or is it a type of coinage? What, what is this currency asses? Oh, that's a great question. And I know that my students laugh at it too. It's spelled A-S as the singular, just A-S. And then in the plural, it's A-S-S-E-S. Um, and so students are always like, what the heck is that? But it is a very small bronze coin. Um, we should say that we went off the gold standard in the 1970s, even though my favorite James Bond film thus was undermined because Goldfinger is one of the greatest films ever. But we do have to remember that Romans had a gold standard, which meant that their coinage was based in the actual worth of their money rather than fiat money. Um, and so ass is a very small bronze coin. Um, and then we have larger silver coins that had worth. Um, and then we have what is called an aureus, which is a gold coin. And sometimes more impoverished people would go their whole life without ever touching a gold coin um, because they were incredibly um, expensive. And because the coin itself is worth what uh, it is used for. You know, so gold, silver, and bronze are are the coinages used by Romans. <laughs> Thank you for uh, for sharing that. And again, it's one of those things that you know someone's going to ask, and then having access to an authority like yourself to 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 bring that out is really fantastic. Thank you. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's important to say these things because there's, I mean. Coinage is very different today, but but I think in the chat you guys have already pointed out it's a lot like a penny. Um, and that's absolutely true, Maureen. Thank you for for bringing that in. And yes, an aureus is a gold coin. And then under Constantine, there's a new gold coin that's called a solidus that he makes. Um, but yeah, Roman coinage is is incredibly um, fascinating. Um, okay, so uh, 
I want to go to punishing capital crimes because I think it's probably something many of you have to talk about, which is crucifixion, when you are addressing why Christ was killed in this manner, or perhaps why Spartacus was killed in this manner. And one thing to note, again, is that Romans believe that punishment is commensurate with the status of the individual. If you are a slave and you have brought about an insurrection and treason like Spartacus did, you are going to be put on on, on a cross, a crux, um, and this lines the Via Appia all the way to the city of Rome. That is the same way that Jesus and the two other robbers that are put beside him uh, die. And this was a very demonstrative and ostentatious way to be killed because Romans are using it as an example of what not to do. Um, so crucifixion is a way of showing people, um, do not do what this individual has done. But I should also say um, that we want to go through a few other punishments that Romans used as well, and that Romans see the way that you die as befitting to who you were in dignity in life. So if you see Judas here, see him hanging from that tree to the left, he hung himself in suicide. That is the most undignified way to kill yourself. If you're Mark Antony, you kill yourself in suicide by falling on your sword or making a slave hold a sword that you fall into. But instead, Judas decides to kill himself in, in a way that Romans would, would even keep you from being buried in certain cemeteries if you hung yourself. And so um, that, that is one reason that you have the gold coins in Judas's bag underneath him. Now, Roman prison systems are different from our own, uh, and this is because Romans do not use prison as a rehabilitation facility. They use jails, um, and I think that, that perhaps people don't fully understand sometimes that there's a huge difference between a jail, which should be a short-term holding space, um, and a prison, which is a long-term area that, that is going to be used to punish someone. Romans don't generally like to use jails if they don't have to. They usually use them as holding spaces until a trial is actually set. And actually, things move very quickly in the Roman justice system. Um, that we have a sense, particularly for citizens, and you can probably see this best, best through the Apostle Paul, um, that when you are a citizen, you have the right to trial. You have the right actually to a speedy trial in the city of Rome itself. And so um, when Paul is being beaten in Asia Minor, what does he say as translated by Jerome? He says, Kivus Romana sum, I am a Roman citizen. And that means he can no longer be beaten. He is no longer allowed to be cudgeled, and he is sent on a ship to go and await trial in the Mamertine prison that you can still go to within the city of Rome uh, today. So Romans generally want to give out punishment as quickly as possible following a trial, whereas in the United States, in terms of our prison industrial complexes, we have thought of prison as a space for reform in order to change people. And this comes in large part from the Quakers in the 17th century in Philadelphia, who developed this idea of solitary confinement reading a Bible. But Romans don't believe that. Um, this is not something that they think that people can be reformed by just sitting in jail. Um, and rather, they would rather send you out um, as punishment uh, for things like exile. So the Roman Emperor Augustus, for instance, uh, sends his own daughter into exile, for instance. Um, we have the punishment of damnation ad bestias, which probably is, is oftentimes our, our best examples are in martyrologies, that is to say the stories of early Christian martyrs in the uh, second and third century CE, probably most famously, we have the killing of Perpetua and Felicitas within Carthage um, in, in the Colosseum there. This is again, very demonstrative death, uh, something that shows people what not to do, in this case, not being a Christian. And so a lot of martyrologies have examples of being, uh, quote unquote, thrown to the beast. Probably the most famous punishment, um, at least within Roman writers like Livy, 
um, is the Tarpeian Rock. And I believe, I'll have to go look at it now. I don't think it's Versace, but it's a fashion house within Rome that is trying to rebuild and fund the, the rehabilitation of the Tarpeian Rock in Rome, which seems like an odd choice. Um, but very famously, you were thrown from the Tarpeian Rock, which is on the Capitoline Hill. It's about 25 meters from the ground. Um, so you would absolutely die being thrown from the Tarpeian Rock, uh, usually. Um, and this is for people who commit highly egregious crimes against the state. So um, murders that disrupted the, the populace, um, sedition, treason, uh, those people who needed to be gotten rid of very quickly. We already mentioned crucifixion, but I should note that we have a lot of depictions of it as connected to Jesus. We have very little bioarchaeological evidence, but uh, here is some of the bioarchaeological evidence that we have here. Um, this is actually uh, the calcaneus um, that is transfixed with an iron nail. So we do know that nails were put directly through feet and usually through hands um, in this mode of crucifixion, which I mentioned before was used on hundreds of slaves during the Third Servile War, um, which Spartacus, we oftentimes call this Spartacan War, um, and uh, by the killing of Christ. Now, because the pater familias was such a big deal, and because he is the icon within the familia, which is the building block, the foundation, and the unit of all Roman society, parricide is a big deal. If you kill your father, if you kill um, the pater familias, then you are going to die a horrible death commensurate with the crime that you have committed. So parricide, uh, for instance, uh, means that you are going to usually be beaten with leather rods and stuck into a sack with a dog, um, a rooster, an ape, and oftentimes a viper. And the number of animals and which animals they are sometimes changes from which historian we are looking at, but that's a pretty bad death. That is a lot of different animals um, that are coming together in one sack as you're being thrown off the Tarpeian Rock. And so it was definitely seen as a deterrent. Do not kill your father. Do not kill your pater familias if you are a slave, um, because otherwise it will result in a very horrible death. Um, Andy, uh, how much longer would you like me to go? Because I will speed up a little bit if, if we need to, to really get through this and we want to have a longer question and answer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got about probably 20, 25 minutes before we'll conclude. So, you know, if you, okay. if you sort of aim for that, we'll take some time at the end for questions from the audience. Perfect. Well, I've already gone over the Praetor's Edict, so I don't want to go over it very more, uh, very much more, but I do want to say that we have um, law codes, which we'll get to in just a second, but that the Praetor's Edict oftentimes is going to oversee the, the kind of day-to-day -day court cases that can be brought between before the Praetor and who has the power to bring it. But we have a heavy development of law during the period that we call the Early Empire. And so after Julius Caesar is killed in 44 BCE, we have a period of, of kind of chaos before the establishment of what we call the Principate. The Principate is what you might call a monarchy. We call it this because the princeps or the first citizen, where we get the word prince from, is Octavian Augustus, who then takes the name Augustus in 27 BCE. And this begins what we call the early empire or the principate. Um, and it's during this time that we see a transference of legal clout from the committee that I talked earlier about, the assemblies, and from the Senate start to be transferred in power over to the emperor. And the emperor also could send out legislation in the form of just letters. So if the emperor writes something called a rescript, he could send out these letters and they automatically become law. In addition to magisterial power, that is to say local magistrates in various provinces that may also be releasing their own edicts, mandates, rescripts, and, and decrees. And because there are so many different laws at the time, they were dependent upon well-educated jurists 
in order to suss out what the overall law should be. Because again, this is based on a civil law code rather than common law. And that meant that there were a lot of shifts and a lot of changes depending on what province you were in because we oftentimes had uh, a difference of opinion and a difference of cases and how they were being ruled upon depending on where you were and what your status was within the Roman Empire. But petty cases oftentimes were submitted directly to local magistrates. So um, let's just say Herod here, or rather um, Pontius Pilate. Um, and then we have Roman governors who are overseeing specifically the criminal cases. So Pontius Pilate more here, um, overseeing criminal cases and private law disputes. And at the very top level, you might even have the emperor coming in and ruling over uh, a specific court decision or a specific trial. Although that didn't happen very often, we are told that the emperor Claudius, for instance, oftentimes sat in as a judge on various um, cases within the city of Rome. And a lot of my students want to know, well, do, do we have law schools at the time? And did this influence then the later formation of law schools within the United States? And the answer is very much yes. Um, there was not a public education program in the way that we have today, but the template that was established by law schools was an example that was oftentimes emulated uh, within the late 18th century into the 19th century within the United States. And the first law school that we really have evidence for is probably um, in the second century CE within the Roman Empire. Um, oftentimes Beirut uh, will, will say that they have the, the earliest law school that, that we know of, um, but we have earlier oratorical schools of thought that actually trained people to be advocates and orators. But I'm talking here about specifically schools that are focused on training for law rather than just rhetoric. Um, and uh, the third century CE is when we've dated the one in Beirut, but we also know that then law schools cropped up in cities like Constantinople and Alexandria. And originally, just like the earliest law schools in the United States, um, they taught in Latin. Um, and later then during the Byzantine Empire, many of these law schools switched to the teaching of Greek. Um, it took about four or five years of instruction, and then we don't really have degrees in the ancient world in the same way we do now, um, but they receive certificates um, in order to perform as professional advocates, and by this time were then paid. So we have, during this period of the High Empire, a formalization of law and then a movement towards codification of many, many years of law that have been building up, specifically since the reign of Constantine, um, who had been victorious at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge and very much influenced the Christianization of many of the law codes. Now, into the Christian period and into the period we call Late Antiquity, which is the later Roman Empire, Christianity and slavery continue to coexist within the law codes of the Theodosian Code, which was brought together and then published in 438 CE, and then later under the reign of Justinian. Um, this idea that slavery was not at odds in any way with Christianity is something that was then adopted and defended by the Founding Fathers um, and also used by Southern slaveholders at a state level quite regularly, that Roman law allowed for slavery and that the Bible also was a document that allowed for the enslavement of chattel individuals. And I think that this still goes back to the idea of the family and the ability of the pater familias to oversee the power of life and death over those within their family. Um, Slaves were something that, that were very common within the Roman Empire as uh, Walter Scheidel, who is a very um, famous classicist and ancient historian at Stanford has talked about at its highest extent in the Roman Italic Peninsula, we had up to 20 to 25% of the entirety of the population enslaved. That means that 25% of the population is seen as property and thus subject to civil law. 
as a piece of property um, that can be stolen. Um, and even when this property is murdered, it is seen as a loss to the person that owns it rather than a crime against the state. So I think that that's a, a big difference from today, but certainly um, can go back to the antebellum South in the United States. Now, the last example of influence on uh, the, the American system that I want to really address is something that I'm starting to write on for, for an article. So I would love you guys' feedback if you want to talk a little bit more about it. Um, but ideas of Roman marriage and the oversight of women um, is something that is really uh, an integral part of Roman law to, to the highest extent. Um, and that is women are not seen as equal or have the ability to have power over their money or, or their property um, unless they get special exemptions from the law. So for instance, um, Roman women do not have full power over top of their, their, their money or their property unless they have three children or more, which is a special loophole that had been created by the Emperor Augustus. And this is going to lead to a system for women and for young children that is called tutelage, or what we call today conservatorship. Um, tutelage was originally a way to help young boys who had applied because they did not have a pater familias. This idea was that every young boy, every slave, and every woman needed to have a pater familias to oversee the things that they did and to make sure that they acted in accordance with the dignity of the republic. Um, now, tutelage for young boys um, would oftentimes fall to the, the closest agnatic relation, oftentimes an uncle, and these tutors uh, would oversee their wills, and also uh, you could have it assigned to you by the praetor himself. The idea was that you have um, young children being overseen um, and guided because they have incredible amounts of money. If you don't have a whole lot of money, um, then, then the curator or the guardian that you have been assigned is not going to have a huge amount of impact. But curatorships for young men would end when they reach puberty. That's around the age of 14. That's when they have a ceremony called the donning of the toga virilis. That the toga virilis is the toga of manlyhood. So oftentimes around the age of 14, you would have the changeover of tutelage, although a praetor could intervene in cases of use up to the age of 25. And these curators were always men, and they would assist in various transactions, selling of property, the spending of money. Um, and uh, a law called the Actio Tutelae actually held tutors and curators accountable for fraud and for negligible acts. But women were oftentimes the ones that, that fell under curatorships and oversight most closely, that women, especially wealthy women, were looked at with uh, a lot of suspicion. And so we only have very few signatures of women because we oftentimes get curators or guardians or pater familiases that, that sign for their wives or for their daughters. Um, a daughter without a pater familias received perpetual tutelage. So not just at the age of 14 did it end, until she marries a man who is her new pater familias, she is still under the oversight. And we're told by two jurists the reasons for this, that women are weak of mind and that they are ignorant of legal matters. Um, and so Gaius and Ulpian really tell us that, that tutelage and the idea that women have a weaker constitution is something that we see even today um, when we see the imposition of conservatorships. Romans have uh, conservatorships for young boys, for women, also for those that are considered to be too old, too infirm, um, or disabled. Uh, and this is something that, that has come to my mind when I'm watching the, the new Britney Spears documentary on Hulu, where conservatorships come from, um, the fact that her dad is the one that is overseeing it. Oftentimes, uh, mostly it is men oftentimes that, that get conservatorships over their daughters. But we are also seeing an increase in conservatorships 
um, and also oversight of older people um, as depicted by uh, movies like I Care A Lot, which is frankly terrifying if you haven't watched it on Netflix yet, um, talking about conservatorships from a legal capacity that are assigned by the courts because just like in Roman antiquity, conservators get paid a yearly salary for doing this service. This is not something they do out of just the goodness of their heart. Sometimes it can be upwards of five to 10% of the income uh, can be transferred over to conservators. But I Care A Lot is about uh, Diane Weiss. She is an older woman who is trapped into a conservatorship by Rosamund Pike and um, Aza Gonzalez. And uh, this is also something that John Oliver talked about on the latest episode of, um, uh, of his show as well. And that really brings us back to the paternal nature of American law and of the American justice system as well. And I know I just sound like a woman that's complaining about the patriarchy, but you know, I am a woman and I am complaining about the patriarchy. Uh, we can see here that Washington in the 1830s is modeled after Jupiter, um, who we saw all the way back on this slide. Look at, look at Washington right there and then cross compare with Jupiter sitting right here. Um, we are seeing a, a very paternalistic formation of the law code that earlier was embedded in a slave society, at least until 1865. Um, and so the relationship between Roman law is sometimes a positive one and sometimes a negative one, but it's very important not simply to romanticize the fossies that we can see here in the pediment of the Supreme Court building right here, uh, and not just to romanticize justitia, which is the allegory um, that we see here, justice, lady justice, um, but to look at these women and men who are in the corners of the pediment. Um, who are not as, as well supported and, and who oftentimes um, suffer. And I applaud the, the American movement um, in order to see equal rights under justice, but unfortunately that was not the case within uh, Roman law. Um, so I look forward to talking to you guys a little bit more and answering any questions that I can. Um, and I apologize for the, the quick nature of this overview, but hopefully it gives us a, a launch pad to thinking a little bit more. Great, thank you so much, Professor. And I'll remind the audience two things. The first is that there are some readings and some resources in the corresponding folder in the digital library for tonight's webinar. And secondly, that there is an Ask Professor Bond tab and please do take a moment to submit your more formal questions. As the moderator, I'll put them in order and bring them forward. The first one, in fact, comes from our friend Roberto, who's joining us from LAUSD. And Roberto is curious, Professor, if you could talk some about uh, the following. Uh, his understanding is that the premise of the foundation of Roman law is the foundation of our criminal justice system. He gets it, but he's curious if, besides Greek and Roman, there are other non-Western influences on our criminal justice system? Well, I think that there, that there certainly have been a lot of colonial influences um, that, that were oftentimes uh, developed by the British government when they were overseeing uh, colonized areas, but um, I'm not familiar with an incredible amount of non-Western influence on, on our current criminal justice system as laid down in the 18th century. Um, that's, that's uh, for me, uh, looking at uh, particularly capital punishment, um, we are one of the, we are certainly um, the largest uh, country that, that still practices capital punishment. And this is something that certainly goes back to Greco-Roman antiquity and um, most, uh, non-Western countries, and I'll have to look up the numbers after we get up, um, almost, every, almost everybody uh, has, has outlawed capital punishment. Um, and I applaud Virginia for being um, a, a state, my own home state, which has, has only recently stopped it. But I think we can see um, a, a very large influence between Greco-Roman law and its connection back to things like 
horrific deaths like capital punishment. But um, that that's uh, not there. I can't think of a, a lot of examples off the top of my head of non-Western laws coming into um, full influence in the criminal justice system. But I'm willing to to learn more about it. It's certainly not my expertise. Hmm. Thank you for uh, for answering that. The next question is from Peter. Peter's wondering if you can uh, speak some about uh, populism and its connections to Roman and American law and politics. He thinks about uh, Gracchi, Julius Caesar, et cetera. Do you see any parallels between them and populism in the United States? Yes, I, I think that that's a, a, something that's important to talk about is that in the late Republic, uh, and this is this period from about 150 BCE until the killing of Julius Caesar in 44 BCE, we have the rise of, of populist politics that we call populares. Um, populares were people that appealed to public opinion and tried to um, uplift many of their causes. So the pro most famous of these are the Gracchi. So we have Gaius and Tiberius who are living, well, they die in the 120s BCE. Um, and both Gaius and, and his uh, older brother um, are persons that court the public opinion, but also try and bring things like free grain um, into the city of Rome, which is called the Anina. Um, they, they try and improve conditions for them. Um, and so we have the, the specific use under the Gracchi of a magistracy that is called the tribunes. And the tribunes, whether you, I mean, I think it's been, co the terminology has certainly been co-opted by Hollywood movies today, um, but tribunes have a special power of veto, which in Latin means I forbid. Veto is, is simply the Latin verb for I forbid it. Um, and so we have uh, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus using the tribunate as a magistracy for the people. And this is something that is eventually so upsetting that it causes violence in the state. And so when I was watching the insurrection on the Capitol, I did think a bit um, a about the violence that breaks out in the late Republic. I think that the violence on the Capitol was very misinformed and illegal and wrong. But at the same time, I saw a lot of parallels with Tiberius being killed by being hit over the top of his head um, with a, a wooden stool that had been taken out of the Curia Senatus. And so the violence that broke out in the late Republic is really what sticks in my mind as perhaps something that we're also living through at the moment uh, or hopefully moving past at the moment, but the events of Charlottesville, the events of, of January, I think remind me of the, the late Republic um, for sure. And and the rise of popularist uh, politics is, is something that the cult of personality was very strong within ancient Rome as well. I think many people forget that Julius Caesar was himself a treasoner. Um, he was somebody who marched on the city of Rome. He declared himself to be dictator because he was not allowed to sit in absentia for the for the magistracy of the consulship. And thus, to me, people celebrate Julius Caesar, and he would have been convicted of maestas and of treason and uh, killed by any other court system if he had not been successful in marching on the city of Rome. So uh, I know my students think I'm a killjoy about this, but um, Julius Caesar, while he's <laughs> interesting to read about, he was a treasoner. <laughs> yeah. Um, th this question um, is coming from Monica just on the road in Durham, and she's curious. You know, we've talked a lot tonight about parallels, about threads, about connections and illusions and, and, and echoes in, in what we have in, in the modern system that draws from ancient Rome. Can you can you share some lessons that you feel we can learn as well? What what can we learn from you know the the evolution of and the uh, the, the sort of the, the long view we have now as we look back on Rome? Revoking the rights of people is never something that that goes over well, and I don't think that it's something. I think it's something we need to really keep in mind today is that limiting the rights of women, limiting the the rights of individuals. 
um, is oftentimes uh, something that, that works against you as a state. So in 212, the Emperor Caracalla extends citizenship to everybody. Um, and that means that everybody living within the Roman Empire, except for its very small group, probably less than 1%, who have been convicted of certain crimes, get the rights of Roman citizenship. Um, and there's a lot of debate over why Caracalla does that, but it brings people into the Roman Empire and gives them citizenship. So when I think about the voting laws that are going on in Georgia right now, which are meant to really exclude the Roman power of suffragium, that is to say suffrage, in order to vote within uh, the state elections and within national elections, um, when I think about the limiting of, of women's rights in, in their abilities in, in order to, for instance, even get an abortion. Um, for me, I think we can learn from the Romans because when rights were limited of specific people, there was a lot of popular unrest and a lot of dissatisfaction as a result. Um, and so uh, looking to uh, Seeing more inclusive measures is, I think, important. You guys read, or many of you read, con an article about Constantine's laws. For instance, Romans, up until the point of Constantine, allow for men and women to bring about a divorce equally. And under the reign of Constantine forward, up to Justinian, increasingly, it's only men who are allowed to bring about a divorce from women for certain circumstances. And so, I think looking to Roman law and seeing the limiting of civil rights is something that we can learn from and change as we go forward. Um, and I know not everybody uh, agrees with my political viewpoints or my pro-choice viewpoints, but um, we can really see dissatisfaction among the Romans when civil rights are, are barred or limited. Mm, thank you. Um, Professor, maybe this is the, the last question of the evening. We're, we're starting to wrap things up and, and draw some conclusions. Um, can you um, can you summarize for me? Can you speak uh, just here at the end uh, about the ways that your students at the University of Iowa respond to the content and the curriculum? And it sounds like even the course that you teach like this, you know, all of the folks in our audience, many of them at least, are teaching kids who will just in a year or two be sitting in your classroom. So whether they're there for their JD or they're for in an undergraduate classroom, how do your students respond to this and where do you find it to be the most effective hooks for this content? Well, my students end every Friday with a debate. Um, so let's say the first week of my class, we have a debate over exile and whether they like it or not, one group has to argue pro exile. Yes, we should bring exile back. Ex exile should be used as a form of punishment. And then the other group learns how to argue from the other side of the table. Um, and so I would say that I try very hard when I'm in class not to talk about my own personal politics, but when it does come out that in the debates, we learn about seeing all points of view from every side of the rhetorical table. And so uh, I think a, a big thing is, is allowing for discussion and allowing for your students to feel safe in debating many of these things. We have a whole week where we debate capital punishment. Um, where we debate divorce and who should be allowed to bring divorce, if divorce should even exist, um, if you should be allowed to dissolve a marriage at all. Um, and so I, I guess for me, I think that you want to lecture to your students, and certainly today I've given you guys a hell of a long monologue. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's coming together in dialogue and healthy debate, which you can model to your students in a way that we don't have in America right now. Um, whether it's on Twitter or whether it's in the press or whether it's on Fox News or CNN, there isn't a lot of civil debate happening on important issues. And so you guys are the ones that can model this to your classrooms of setting the terms and having people debate things. I would say the only thing, do not debate and do not um, have a uh, an attempt to defend in any way is slavery. Um, I, I think that it's very important to say that um, Romans may have had a slave society, but 
Um, in no way should we be placing our students in an uncomfortable position of having them perform or play out or defend slavery because it's it's ethically indefensible. So I will say definitely debate and definitely bring this to your students, but always remember that some subjects are incredibly painful. Um, and so holding mock auctions of slaves, which classicists have done for many years in the United States, or having a debate over whether slavery should exist is should not be part of that pedagogy. Professor Sarah Yvonne, thank you so much for sharing your insights and joining us tonight. I really do appreciate you joining our session. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I missed the research triangle. I missed that barbecue. <laughs> Come back anytime. I want to thank all of our audience and invite all of you to join us for barbecue in Durham. Um, I'd invite you to follow the National Humanities Center. Our social media feeds are a great place to see upcoming opportunities and uh, get reminders. One of them you will see is a reminder for applications for our Teacher Advisory Council. We'd love to see uh, all of you consider applying and sending us our application by May the 3rd. Uh, please do join us for our next session. Wait a minute. Let me check my calendar. That's tomorrow night. Back to back, we have a doubleheader this week. We'll be joined by uh, Jerry Podair from uh, Lawrence University in Illinois. Uh, not Illinois, he's in Wisconsin. Uh, the title of tomorrow night's session is Awful Choices, Bayer Johnson's Radical Vision and the Social Movements of the 1960s. Uh, we do hope to see you again. Um, if it's not tomorrow night, then hopefully at one of our remaining sessions. Please have a great day at school tomorrow, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>